Hey, everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. As autistic ADHD business owners, Patrick and I both understand the importance of promotion and doing it in a way that feels authentic and genuine. If you are a neurodivergent business owner and you would like to place your services or products in front of a neurodivergent audience, we are now opening up our podcast for sponsorships and we're providing a 10% discount code for neurodivergent business owners. So if you are an autistic or ADHD business owner, and you'd like to get in front of our audience, reach out to Divergent Conversations Podcast at gmail.com for more information. So, Patrick, earlier this week, you sent me a screenshot of a bunch of DMs asking that we do an episode on narcissism versus autism. And when I saw those DMs, I had a mixed reaction both like yes i know we need to go there and be like i don't want to go there (laughs) um and but i know we need to because this has also been the biggest request i've gotten for a venn diagram which i haven't actually created and i'll unpack that later um so people are really interested in this topic of what is narcissistic personality disorder what is autism so that's what we're going to talk about today yeah and I could tell that I could actually experience your experience through your responses via text message when, when you sent them. Ooh, what was uh, that like for you? I, it just felt like where I was attuned to how you were feeling. And I also just kind of was thinking about how often it gets mentioned in, co- in um, the same sentence, um, especially on social media. And I know that just even using the term narcissism, narcissistic personality, et cetera, right now is like a pretty hot topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's why it feels like a really hard conversation to know how to enter because there's so much misinformation on so many things. And I want to like provide so many disclosures or caveats or footnotes because Everything we're talking about, like co-occurring personality disorder and autism, narcissism, um, theory of mind and all the things we'll get into, like every one of those deserves a really hefty footnote. Yes. And I know that we're also doing this as kind of like an introduction to the topic. So we're going to use that as a blanket overarching statement right now is that this is a 30 minute conversation. This is a hot topic. This is going to potentially create some controversy. We know this, and we want to do this as intentionally as we can. And we will also come back and do more episodes surrounding said topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? That is so fair to say. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, First, let's spend a a little bit on narcissism. Um, I'm curious your thoughts. I, I, I think this is a tricky diagnosis. Okay. First though, one thing I'm seeing is an increase of people quickly calling other people narcissists. Um, and narcissistic abuse is a very real thing. And it's a, like, it is, I I've worked with several people who have been on the other end of that. And it is, um, it is terrible. And I I'm also seeing this cultural tendency where people are kind of knee jerk reaction. Oh, that's a narcissist or that's an like, or that's narcissistic abuse where I think that is, you know, we talked about misinformation a while back, I think around narcissism and how quickly people are calling other people in their lives, narcissists. I would say that's an area where I'm seeing a lot of misinformation. Do you, first of all, let me just check in. Do you agree with that assessment? Do you disagree? Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And this comment might get some some slack too, but slack, that's not the word. Slack. I don't know. <laughs> People may not be happy with this comment as well, but I, I think that this is like social media driven in a lot of ways as well. Mm-hmm. Because it's again, we talked about 
we talked about like TikTok diagnoses, how you and I are both on board with self-diagnosis. We both completely both believe that it is a valid tool. And I also think that there is a lot of there are a lot of content creators right now who are specifically talking about narcissistic abuse, narcissists in general. And you're right, narcissistic abuse is a completely valid experience. And it's a it's a very traumatic one for the mm-hmm. person who's on the other side of it. However, dot dot dot, not everyone who exhibits one tendency or trait or characteristic is then therefore a narcissist. Right, right. And I think and that's the murky yes. stuff, right? Absolutely. And I think we live, I mean, we, we are living, there's, you know, Pew Research has, has looked at this. This was before the pandemic and before everything that's happened socioeconomically in the last, you know, four or five years. Um, they showed that we were living in the most polarized state in the U.S. ideologically than ever before. I cannot imagine what the numbers are now. What happens when we are in a polarized culture is we tend to, um, as humans, we just tend to become more reactionary. And I think part of what I see happening on a cultural level is we are losing our tolerance to disagree with people. We're losing our tolerance to be uncomfortable by someone else's view. Like if we're in disagreement, then you are X to me. And there's this tendency then to project onto the person we disagree with um, like character traits and, or diagnoses like narcissism or the other, I think the two personality disorders that are kind of, I would say misused in this way are borderline personality disorder and narcissism. I agree a hundred percent. And I know we could go down that road and do an entire like hour long episode about the projection from a clinical standpoint as well. And I know I want to, we want to keep it Trying to rein us in, Patrick. This is a tread lightly conversation. I just think there's so many landmines to step over. Yeah. Are you nervously sweating right now like me? I can, I can like withstand commentary for the most part. So without it really. Interesting. For me, it's like, I guess the commentary, but for me, it's also about the saying something, you know, I, I am more ADHD in my language use than autistic. So I'll sometimes say things be like, that's, that's not what I meant. And then it's the anxiety of living with that comment being out there out of context and wishing I would have said it differently. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I think you were, you're kind of writing us in. Okay. So narcissism and autism, this conversation, this question comes up a lot of either people who have perhaps been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, but they think they're autistic. Or I, I think a lot of the comments you get and also comments I get are from partners of like potentially autistic. Often, often what I see, I'm curious what you see, it's often heteronormative partnerships and where it's the the woman reaching out about her husband. Is that where you also have mostly? That is what I see for the most part. And those are the DMs that we get. Please help me help my husband. Please help me better Mm -hmm. understand him. Um, Please explain the differences between the two because Mm -hmm. I think that my husband's autistic, but he's very narcissistic or something Mm -hmm. to that degree. Yeah. And I've heard that the two go hand in hand is what I also hear. Yeah. Yeah. So I went, I actually have a draft of a Venn diagram. I didn't publish it because I I didn't have the psychological strength. Um, Well, actually, it's not just about that. I think to make a Venn diagram, I'd have to go revert to a lot of the unfortunate stereotypes about autism. And so I have complex feelings around that because I'd be comparing like theory of mind to narcissistic, like um, kind of, um, I can't remember the clinical term off the top of my head, but that tendency to, it's all about me tendency in narcissism. So that kind of live in your own world. So that's the other reason I haven't made a Venn diagram is it falls back on these very stereotypical pathological ways of talking about autism to compare the traits. Um, And I think that's why I've steered clear of the conversation. However, like these autistic things are stereotypes for a reason. And to me, that's, I think, where the conversation gets anxiety inducing and gets complicated of there are autistic people out there who struggle with theory of mind. And just to define theory of mind, it's that tendency of like 
seeing the world through someone else's lens. Um, it's been really, it's been reconceptualized by Milton and the double empathy problem of autistic people tend to do better with theory of mind with other autistic people. Allistic people do better with it with other allistic people. But I think even, oh, I don't know how to say this, Patrick. I don't know how to say this. I really like the double empathy conceptualization. That's my experience of theory of mind. I definitely do work. It's interesting. Um, I've definitely seen and worked with autistic people where that classic definition of theory of mind is, is a struggle of like perceiving the world as someone else's do. I think that is more associated with alexithymia than autism. So when, when someone is autistic and has severe alexithymia, they tend to be very external oriented thinkers versus internal oriented thinkers. Meaning rather than thinking about like their internal experience, they're often thinking about external factors. Um, someone who doesn't think a lot about their own internal experience probably isn't going to think a whole lot about someone else's internal experience. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there for a second because that just, I feel like that was, that was a bit. No, I think that's a great conceptualization. Yeah, I think you're right. So if you're not thinking of your own internal experience, it's really hard to place yourself into the position of someone else to think about their own internal experience, right? And if we're thinking about alexithymia, we've done an episode on it. And that episode obviously doesn't do the topic justice because it's, again, just an hour. But the reality of like, if I'm struggling on my day to day with my own internal experience and really being able to connect to it, does that then therefore make me narcissistic? And the answer is no. no. Yeah. Absolutely. No. Like, capital N, capital O, exclamation point. But it can feel that way to the partner, the partner particularly. And here's what right. I, so there's this really unfortunate term called Cassandra syndrome. It's, it's very pathological. Um, it's essentially the experience. And again, typically heteronormative partnership they're talking about here where a woman, I, I think it originally was like a woman goes to therapy and she it thinks there's so much wrong with her and what gets on packed because partly her partner's telling her like you're too emotionally needy and all these things and then what gets unpacked is that a lot of these women were married to undiagnosed autistic men um so again it's a really pathologizing way of thinking about it it also like there are a lot of people whose experience is one of significant confusion when they're married to an undiagnosed autistic person and i would say someone who's undiagnosed and not curious right like if you're autistic and you're curious you're curious about your experience, you're curious about your partner's experience. That's a whole different story. Um, typically the people who are contacting me, probably the people contacting you, their partner's not curious. Again, that external oriented thinking is probably really high. Um, but there's also a lot of defensiveness around even considering something like autism. And so there's not space. I mean, we've talked about the metaphor of constriction versus openness. There's no openness in the dyad to talk about what's happening. So I do see it in, the, in those experiences where for the partner who's, and, and sometimes I've seen it where the, the partner is autistic as well. Like it's an autistic, autistic partnership, but this is still happening. Um, it's like the only way to exist with that person is to live in their subjectivity. And what I mean by that is to live within the like framework and the rules and the world of the partner who is not as curious and struggles to have insight into their internal experience. Um, and that can be a really hard way to have a relationship. It's also very similar to narcissism. You tend, the only world that exists tends to be within the narcissistic's um, subjectivity. And again, someone with NPD can get treatment. And like, I don't want to say that this is like an, a person with narcissism who has good insight could also work on this. Um, but classically speaking is to exist in the other person's subjectivity. The reasons are totally different, but the experience could be felt very similarly for the partner. Did that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I think that's such a, that's an important part. That's probably one of the most important things to hone in on right now is what exactly what you just said. The experience can be similar, but the 
intention or the reason is different, right? Like, so there, that's something to really think about is the experiences can look almost like mirroring one another if you're coming at it from a certain perspective. But the reality is there's, there's different, there's foundationally different reasons for what's happening in the experience. And I think that's really important. And I think that gets overlooked probably the most often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about other things that, because you said, I have the, I have the Venn diagram created it, but publishing it would take too much psychological energy and labor, most likely because of the responses I imagine in the comments and you would have to be very available. Yeah. To yeah. Well, those, those Venn diagrams go viral and I don't want to be promoting, um, stereotypes about autism. So I, I don't yeah. know how to make it. And yeah, I don't know how to make it in a way that like, I guess I could do a star and an asterisk next to each trait. Um, but like the reasons they look similar, I really think the reasons they look similar is the case of autism with severe alexithymia. So that's a hard thing to nuance in a, in a graphic. Maybe someday I'll figure out how to do that. Um, cause the other one that comes up is a lack of empathy, right? Like that that's one of the reasons someone seems narcissistic. And for one that could be, um, so again, lack of empathy, there's been brain studies on this. They, they looked at brain scans. Um, this was an empathy. There's kind of an, I won't get into the research, the design of the study, but, um, essentially they did brain scans and then when they controlled for alexithymia, so controlled for means when they separated the autistic people with alexithymia from the autistic people without alexithymia, they did find that autistic people with alexithymia had lower activity in the empathy regions when, when a loved one was experiencing pain. Um, for autistic people without, alexith al without alexithymia, it was the same as autistic people. So it's alexithymia, not autism, that can impact empathy regions in the brain. Um, so where was I going? Empathy. The other reason, besides alexithymia, an autistic partner might not be as empathet empathetic as an holistic partner might not might want. It's because of communication, right? Like I'm not a mind reader. I rely on explicit communication. If my partner's upset with something but hasn't told me why, um, sometimes I mean I'm pretty good at picking up patterns and cues that I'll look, I'll usually ask, but I'm trained to do that. So it also can be a communication difference of if one, especially if one partner is really indirect in their communication but they're expecting their autistic partner to um, be able to pick up on indirect communication, that's, that could show up as, well, my partner has no empathy when really that's a communication issue. And I imagine that right there is probably the crux of so much of what we're talking about is these miscommunication styles um, in so many ways, because in partnerships in general, whether it's holistic, autistic, 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 the communication that's being missed and not explicitly being asked for or communicated or being able to say, this is what I need to be able to communicate in terms of our relationship or process what you're saying. I mean, that if you're not a trained clinician, these are skills that people often do not have or possess or are able to articulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So another communication one that can look like narcissism is how we connect. So for example, a lot of autistic people, we connect by sharing stories. So Patrick, if you were like, this stressful thing happened to me, blah, blah, blah. I might be like, oh my gosh, this one time this thing happened to me. And right, that's a natural way for us to connect. For someone outside of our culture, it looks like, oh, Megan Anna just made it about her versus what I'm really communicating is like, oh, I can understand that. I think I can understand the emotion you're experiencing because I had something similar. Now, what I've learned to do is the dance back. This is where like, Patrick, if you were sharing something, I'd maybe share a story about a similar experience. What I've learned to do is then explicitly bring it back to you. Be like, you know, so I kind of felt like this when that happened to me, did you feel something similar? Because I've learned adding that explicit kind of dance back is communicating. I'm sharing this because I'm, but I'm wanting to center your experience. I'm not trying to center it. Um, but that's kind of a sophisticated thing to learn. I think I learned that 
through masking and through training, um, there's a lot of autistic people where they don't do that da- dance back. So it, the people in their lives think whenever I share anything, they just end up making it about them. Right. And in reality, what you're trying to convey is like, I have experienced something similar and I do in fact have empathy for you. And this is my way of sharing that I can connect with your experience. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, so you, you just mentioned it again, but the, the training and, and the intentionality and the, the curiosity here, we're, you know, we're, we're very privileged to be in a percentage of human beings who not only have higher education, but are trained clinicians and are trained in behavior and are trained in tracking and attunement and, and inferring. And I think that for a lot of people listening to this episode who are not trained, right, clinicians, it's so easy to miss the mark and then to take it really personally, um, whether it be via communication or, you know, if you feel like your partner or your friend or your family member is always centering their experiences or they don't have empathy for your problem or your struggle, that's going to feel pretty crappy regardless of the reason. And it's really easy to put language to it nowadays and say, well, it's because they don't have it. They don't care. They're, they're narcissistic. They don't care about my experience at all. And that, that very well could not be the case. Right, right. And it also might be the case. Right. <laughs> Which right? is like why this conversation is so complicated. Because I think we could, you could say that for almost everything we, we kind of denote, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, not all autistic people are awesome humans. Just in the sense right. that, like, not all humans are awesome humans. Maybe there is an autistic person who who does, again, because they're external oriented thinkers and all these things, they, they do like struggle to think about their, but we're, we're using partners a lot. Cause I think a lot of our requests comes from partners, their, right. their partner's experience. And maybe like, we haven't even talked about characters and values. Like maybe, maybe they're, maybe they are lower on the empathy scale for other reasons or the compassion scale. Um, and, or maybe they're narcissistic, right? Like these things can co-occur. That's another misinformation thing I'm seeing a lot is where people are saying you can't be both autistic and have a personality disorder. I think someone put that on a graphic and that's just not true. You do have to, before you diagnose a personality disorder, you have to rule out what are considered the neurodevelopmental conditions or any other reason that would like better explain the symptoms you're seeing. So in the case of someone who's autistic, if they are having symptoms beyond what autism, and I would say beyond what traumatized autism could explain, then you might also diagnose the personality disorder. So, And if we conceptualize personality disorders as kind of broadly speaking, a vulnerable neurology paired with an invalidating environment of course, we're going to be more likely to develop personality disorders. And that's also well documented that we, we do have higher rates of personality disorder. And I don't think that's all misdiagnosis. I think it's because we have a very vulnerable neurology and we're misattuned to for much of our life. And so it makes sense that we develop these at higher rates. So an autistic person could also have narcissistic personality disorder. One, I love the way you just framed that. A vulnerable neurology, invalidating environment. So you said, "Yep, yep." Right. That's so well said to conceptualize and, and to think about it that way. And also, this conversation is clear as mud for most people listening, right? Because it's like this could be true, this could be true, this could not be true, and that's really what we are trying to kind of articulate to our listeners: is like this is a really complicated conversation. And the labels that get thrown around are, are really damaging and sure. can be really, really painful for people um, when, when they are used because someone has been hurt or because it feels like this is what society says um, mm-hmm. about this person if they exemplify A, B, C, D characteristics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is, is it okay if I shift context a little bit? Because there's another context I've got in this question, which is work. Yeah. So this was the first time that I thought, oh, maybe I should make a Venn diagram. It was someone contact me, contacting me that was saying, can you please make a Venn diagram? Because I like, I think they were maybe fired from their job and being a 
being accused of being narcissistic um, when really what was happening was autistic communication, right? And again, like things like hierarchy um, that could, if I'm coming into a meeting, I actually had this experience. I had this experience in my internship with my supervisor. I think he didn't know what to do with me because I didn't perceive the hierarchy in the way I think he thought I should. And I, I he, in um, a review, called me like overconfident or something. Um, but that sort of, like if I have a good idea in a meeting, even if I'm not high in the hierarchy, I'm going to share it because it's a good idea. Um, and a lot of autistic people are like that, but that could look like subverting hierarchy and be narcissistic. Um, and other like communication traits can look like that in the workplace. And then that can lead to workplace discrimination. Um, so that's another context that that this can show up and we're understanding like, no, that's autistic communication. That's not narcissism um, would actually be really helpful. That is really helpful. And I imagine a lot of you who are listening have experienced a workplace where maybe that has been the situation or you found yourself in a relationship where that was the perception of you because of how you communicate, get your ideas across. I know I probably have done that a million times in like meetings where it was just all fluff and stupid bullshit. And I probably was just like, Hey, what about this idea? Like, what about this thing? Can we just implement this? I know I've actually said that out loud. Like, can we just be done with this meeting and like implement this thing? Because we're sitting there for two hours going around in circles about nothing. And that was really much more about energy preservation at that time. And if you want me to be here nine to 10 hours a day, mm -hmm. I, I need to be able to work mm -hmm. and function to the best of my abilities. And so I, I know I've certainly communicated in ways where I'm like, this is just what I'm experiencing in the moment. Yeah. And look at you, right? Like you're a tall white man who, if yeah. you're like coming in with that energy, I could be like, oh my gosh, Patrick, such a like so full of himself, right? Like that's an easy narrative to adopt if you don't know you and understand you. Absolutely. I've heard that narrative from several of my close friends right now who used to be in my supervision group where we'd be like, you know, sharing feelings, sharing ideas. And I'm like, can we just get to the point? Can we just get to the point? Yeah. Well, and that, okay, so dismissiveness. This is actually, sorry, I totally cut you off. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Dismissiveness. <laughs> sorry, I just cut you off. <laughs> yeah, I'm dismissing you. Um, no, but this, like, I don't value emotions in the same way a lot of holistic people do. And so I do know I'm more prone to dismiss them because they seem illogical to me. That, Like, now that I understand the science of emotions, I actually care about them a little bit more. Um, but the... And, and someone in a relationship with a narcissist who's, who's not in treatment, doesn't have insight into the experience of, sorry, I shouldn't say with a narcissist. Uh, I, we use a lot with identity language, but I think it would, for that, I think with narcissistic personality disorder, I feel like is a more empathetic way of communicating. Okay, rabbit trail. Um, there's gonna be a lot of invalidation and dismissal in a relationship like that. And I think, Again, especially for an autistic person with alexithymia, as soon as emotions come up, um, if that's really important for the other person, they, they could feel deeply dismissed. Like I, I know I've dismissed people when I've, especially because I, I can get kind of irritated of like, no, just look at this logically, um, which is really, I, I now realize that's, that's really dismissive. That's not effective communication. If you're trying to move toward resolution, you've got to like, validate the feelings and then maybe that creates capacity for logic whereas i come at it the flip i want to start with logic to understand the emotions right yeah but i think the big takeaway right is like whether we both have just kind of shared ex examples of probably how we have dismissed people in our circles professionally or or colleagues etc not intentionally just because it was like, we need to cut through, we need to use the logic, we need to get to the point, we need to move on, whatever the case might be, whatever situation we're in. But we both probably also felt remorse and regret for dismissing that person's act, uh, idea or thought or statement. And that, I think, shows that's where you start to build this, this sense of self, too, of like, okay, I, I care very deeply about this relationship. I That's my fuck up. Like, that's my... I, I will try harder to try to 
give and take a little bit in terms of communication when we're, we're in these environments. I think you might be a better human than me because I don't all like, I mean, when I, yeah, when I care about the person and when it's a genuine, like I've missed them, I, I deeply care. So like sure. my core family, my clients, like that's really important. But when I'm in a conversation and I feel like the other person is not being logical, I actually don't like walk away from that conversation and be like, oh my gosh, I was, I feel so bad. I'm like, damn emotions. I mean, okay. Not always, but, I, but I've definitely had, so I just want to like humanize. I don't always walk away from those encounters. But sometimes totally. I'm like irritated at the other person of like, why doesn't your brain work more like mine? And I, I'll talk myself through that, right? Like to not stay in that kind of, um, that sounds really bitter, but I, I want to be honest about the fact that, that I have those moments. That is part yeah. of my experience. Absolutely. I, I certainly don't walk away from every one of those situations. Like, deeply remorseful or or full of like uh resentment towards myself or self-deprecating because i do think sometimes when you're when you, and maybe i'm wrong is when you say like damn it why doesn't your brain work like mine it's like because of how hard we often have to work to feel seen validated or understood and for me that's where that like damn it why doesn't your brain work like mine that moment is where that often comes up is when i feel misunderstood of yeah. like where I feel missed, where I feel mm -hmm. um, unseen in terms yeah. of like sh in, in any capacity, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's this really like intense moment I experience where I have this feeling and I, I see this a lot with, with folks of like, if I could just inject my logic into your brain, if you could see it the way I see it, then this whole misunderstanding would be cleared up. So I get, then I can kind of dig into like, I want you to see it how I see it. Not because, and not in a like power dynamic of like, I need you to see the world through my, but like, I think I'm seeing something. And usually it's like a relational dynamic where I'm like, I see what's happening here. Like your stuff over there is, is kicking in with my stuff over here. And if we can put it in a conceptual framework, we can understand it. Um, and so I'm trying really hard to inject that understanding into the other person. We're even realizing the word inject, like that's very violent sounding, right? Um, but I have those, it's almost like a panic moment of like, you just need to see what I see. Cause then we can move clearly through it. Um, I have enough, like typically I have enough regulation skill that I can kind of walk myself through that, but I could see how that panic moment could come across as really dominating. Um, especially if someone doesn't have insight into like what's happening for them in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. I agree hundred percent. I think this happens. I'm diverging just a little bit, but I think those panic moments are for me happen most often when I'm in like a medical provider's office and like they just dismiss what I'm saying. And I get mm -hmm. so like immediately frustrated and I feel so invalidated and dismissed. And then I feel unseen. But then I shut down most of the time. I don't hop in like I'm just me like too. And then I, it's almost shame inducing in a way of like, I just can't feel understood here. Like that, that's mm -hmm. really what happens to me. Yeah. I would say that's what happens to me 90% of the time. And then those few times where I have tried to like get my, my perspective, like accessible into someone else's head, those don't go well. And then I tend to shut down even more deep in that relationship. Yeah. Um, so shutting down just kind of often feels like the better option. I just got a wave of sadness, Patrick. We both shut down when we're feeling dismissed. Um, so to put it in like nervous system framework, we kind of go freeze mode, maybe fawn mode. For autistic people that go fight mode, that could look really narcissistic. My brain has a couple of thoughts right now as I'm experiencing this heaviness. One, we should probably do an episode on meltdowns and shutdowns. Mm -hmm. uh, two, yeah, like polar ends of the spectrum in terms of nervous system reaction, in terms of fight mode versus fog or freeze mode. And yeah, it could, it could certainly look very narcissistic in a way if that's the reaction in this moment. Okay. Okay. I think what I don't want to say and that this is the balance I'm wanting to walk. I don't want to say that autistic people can't be harmful in our relationships. Of course we can. We're human. 
I, I also don't want to say that oh, autistic people are narcissistic or that every time you see someone with low empathy, you're like, oh, they're autistic. So walking that line of, um, there's plenty of indecent or not indecent, it feels plenty of like autistic people out there who are not compassionate partners. There's plenty of holistic people out there who are not compassionate partners. Um, it's, there's a lot more going on than our neurology. Our neurology certainly complicates things. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a delicate balancing act to honor both of these, all of the really negative stereotypes around autism. Um, well, uh, well, also being honest with like, we're not all high empathy we're, and we're not all high empathy all the time. Yeah. I can't add anything to that other than just saying that is, yeah, that's completely true. And I think that's also maybe some of the heaviness that we're both experiencing right now. It's just st the stereotypes that all, a lot of autistic people face and experience, coupled with the fact that people are also people. Mm -hmm. And although we're more prone to discrimination and struggle and a lot of uh, complicated scenarios, believing every autistic person is have good mm -hmm. character traits like that's just the yeah. reality it can't be right right and i will say i mean to bring it back to intersectionality like the i think this presentation of autism that often gets talked about and then that the stereotypes get created about is often when the autism is intersecting with a lot of privileged identities um which makes sense to me i'm not sure i can articulate why that makes sense to me i have thoughts but um i also feel like that's an important part of the conversation is it it really typically is at cis white men that um this conversation revolves around not always but often it's yep. you patrick <laughs> thinking of all the taylor swift memes of on the problem it's me right now except you don't fall into that stereotype no but just you, like you, you're curious, you know. you're curious and you, you right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what we've talked about on almost every episode is like openness and curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Like versus constriction and just really being curious about experience. But yeah, I mean, privilege does absolutely shift and shape the lens that we see the world through too. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think you have to be as curious about the world, about your experience, about other people's experiences, when you have a lot of privilege, you got to walk into a room and like, it takes privilege to not be thinking about what's happening in that room, like relationally in other people's minds. You can't do that if you're not safe and privilege and safety walk hand in hand. So actually, okay, I'm, this is just coming to me in the moment, but I'm curious about the connection between like privilege, curiosity, and like curiosity of self and curiosity of other. Yeah. I mean, if you get to, if you can walk into the room and identify and look the way that I do, you don't really have to think about how the world is impacting everybody else in, in that room. Mm -hmm. Because it's not impacting you in the same way for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. That scanner doesn't have to be on for your safety. No. You can do a whole episode on that too. Heavy conversations create new ideas. So that feels like a tagline. Happy conversations. Like great good, yeah. ideas. We're yeah. gonna have we're gonna start making t-shirts and, and all sorts Ooh. of swag for whatever conversation. That'd be fun. It's like, another idea that's actually not a bad idea. Okay. My brain's diverging all over the place, which is kind of telling me I don't have much left to give in this conversation. Um I don't know how you're feeling right now. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a good time to wrap up. I would love to go um, dig into the research a little bit more. I'd be curious about people's comments on this episode and then maybe we can do a follow-up episode because, I, I, yeah, the conversation is really complicated, but I think this is a good starter episode on this topic. Yeah, I agree. I think we tried to walk the line as best we can and I guess we'll know when it comes out depending on how it's reacting to. But I don't feel like one way or another right now, which is usually a good indication that we did our best. Um, what I will say to everyone listening is we want your comments and we want your questions. And you can email us your questions 
you can email us topics at divergent conversations podcast at gmail.com. We aren't really going to check Instagram messages as much just because Megan and I both have too many of those messages coming in in different ways in, in our lives and it's just not possible. But if you do have comments, if you do have questions, please send them to us. I mean, we want to we want to address what we can when we when we feel like we are able to do so. And this is a starter topic. So we try to use lots of disclaimers and asterisks and setting the stage, but that can get missed sometimes too. So yeah. And I have one more asterisk before you do this. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. There there's also a lot of people out there who do have NPD who like who are doing the work to get insight into it. And so um I, I also realize that in, that this conversation when we're like, don't compare us to to people with NPD, like that can be really pathologizing to people with NPD. Um, and that's a, another reason why I feel so much complexity around this conversation. So I do want to add that asterisk in there before we close off. So we're going to have all these asterisks and disclaimers in the show notes, as well as um, all the information that we just talked about. So again, just a starter conversation and we will revisit it in the future. But we get so many questions and DMs about the topic that it felt important to address sooner than later because we want you all to know that we listen to what you have to say and we know that the conversation's out there to be had. And so just want to name that as well. So for everyone listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast, new episodes are out every single Friday on all major platforms and YouTube. You can like, download, subscribe, and share. We will see you next week. Bye.